In this video, we leave Rainbow Falls Provincial Park, travel east along Highway 17 to visit Agosaban River Falls and Gorge, after which we stopped in Marathon to stock up on food. From Marathon, we headed further east to camp in Pakistan National Park. Recall that a goal of this part of the spring 2022 travel was to visit sites close to Lake Superior where Arctic disjunct plants have been reported. I wanted to determine if there was any geological influence on the location of those Arctic disjunct flora. Agosaban Falls is located between Schreiber and Terrace Bay, Ontario, on the north shore of Lake Superior. It is an area where Arctic disjunct plant have been reported. So, join me on the continuing quest for rare Arctic disjunct plants at Agosaban Falls, close to the Lake Superior shore. Enjoy! The first stop was Agosaban Falls and Gorge, located about 1.5 kilometers or about one mile west of Terrace Bay. Arctic disjunct flora are reported to grow along the edge of the Agosaban Burr Gorge, across from the waterfall. Unfortunately, we arrived to find the trail was gated because the conditions along the trail were dangerous. The Agosaban River was still in flood stage and there was a lot of water flowing over the falls. The river flow over the falls generated a lot of mist and spray, which made the trail along the edge of the gorge very slippery and very wet, and therefore very dangerous. We stayed a few minutes to admire the waterfall from the observation platform. From the observation platform, we get some insight why Arctic disjunct plants grow along the south side of the gorge. First, the narrow river gorge runs towards the southeast. That means the southwest side of the gorge faces towards the northeast. That southwest side of the gorge receives less direct sunlight compared to the areas that face directly to the south. Second, this part of the gorge is located directly across from Agosaban Falls. The water flowing over the waterfall creates mist and spray during the summer. That mist and spray help keeps the area moist during the hot summer. And third, this part of the gorge is located about one kilometer or 0.6 of a mile north of Lake Superior. Landward winds blow cold, moist air off the cold water of Lake Superior. Those cold winds help keep the area cool and moist during the hot summer. Together, these three factors help create an Arctic or subarctic habitat that supports Arctic disjunct flora, even during the heat of the summer. While standing on the observation deck, looking at the gorge, it's interesting to speculate if there is a geological influence on the formation and trend of the river gorge. In this area, the Agosavan River Gorge has steep walls that trend grossly towards the southeast. The steep walls of the gorge can be attributed to the rock type in this area, which is granite. The distribution of granite is colored pink on this simplified geology map. Granite can be strong and can support very steep walls. What about the trend of the river gorge in this area? Is there a geological process that may have created a southeast trending gorge? Well, about 2,450 million years ago, this part of the Canadian Shield started to split apart along weak lines that geologists call faults. Liquid molten rock flowed up from the Earth's mantle to fill these weak zones. That molten liquid cooled and solidified into a black colored rock that geologists call the Metachuan Diabase Dyke Swarm. That's a bit of a mouthful. The geological process that created the Metachuan Diabase Dyke Swarm affected a huge area of the Canadian Shield. On the bedrock geology map of the Terrace Bay area, the Metachuan diabase dikes are colored orange, and many follow a northwest to southeast trend. 
the trend of the Matachuan Diabase Dyke Swarm is parallel to that of the Aguasaban River Gorge in this immediate area. Although it is speculation, it is possible that the Aguasaban River Gorge in this immediate area follows a weak zone of faulted rock which elsewhere is occupied by Matachuan Diabase Dykes. During the last ice age, glaciers perhaps partially scraped out and removed some of the weakened rock. And after the ice age ended, the powerful erosive flow of the Aguasaban River further deepened and shaped the river gorge along the zone of weak rock to create the gorge that we see today. So although I was not able to access the area where Arctic disjunct plants are reported to occur, the geology of the area would certainly support those plants based on, number one, the southeast trend of the Aguasaban River Gorge, which runs parallel to the trend of Metachuan diabase dikes in this part of Canada. So the geological process that created the weak southeast trending zones in the continent may also have been enhanced by the Aguasaban River to create the river gorge. Secondly, the strong, hard granite rock in this area would certainly support nearly vertical walls of the gorge. And thirdly, the gorge might help channel cold, moist air from Lake Superior up to the north along the gorge itself to keep the local area cool even during a hot summer. These three factors converged to create a local habitat that supports Arctic disjunct plants. After admiring the Aguasaban Falls and River Gorge from the lookout platform, we followed an old sandy trail to a bridge that crosses the Aguasaban River downriver from the falls close to Lake Superior. From the bridge, the magnitude of the spring flood was really obvious. It was a dramatic illustration of the power of the Aguasaban River as it tumbled towards Lake Superior. The trail to the bridge tells another interesting geological story. The trail is sandy all the way from the parking lot to the lower Aguasaban River Bridge. The sand is left over from the last great ice age when ice sheets covered almost all of Canada. Those ice sheets ground and gouged out the land to create the Great Lakes we see today. But about 10,500 years ago, the ice sheet began to melt in the Terrace Bay area. The ice age was coming to an end. The glacier meltwater filled the basins to become the ancestral Great Lakes. That meltwater also created rushing rivers. Where the rushing rivers entered the ancestral Lake Superior, sandy deltas were formed where the meltwater rivers dumped their sediment load. This is a photo of an historic delta that was created by a meltwater river that flowed into the ancestral Lake Superior at the end of the last ice age. The beds, or layers of sand and gravel deposits, formed when the river dumped its sediment load underwater at the front edge of the delta. In this photo, the meltwater river flowed from right to left. Sand beaches also formed along the edge of the ancestral Lake Superior. If you've walked this trail, you might be thinking, wait, the sand trail is several hundred meters above the present level of Lake Superior. And you are correct. The lake level of ancestral Lake Superior was indeed much higher than today. These sand beaches and the sand delta deposits are part of the evidence that tells the story of the rise and fall of Lake Superior water levels. In the past, the water level of Lake Superior was much higher than today. Perhaps you've watched the Canadian National Film Board video entitled The Rise and Fall of the Great Lakes, starring the famous canoeist Bill Mason. That video tells part of the story of the changing water levels in the Great Lakes. Check it out if you've not already seen it. After the visit to Aguasaban River Falls and Gorge, we continued east to the town of Marathon to get provisions and then on to Puckasaw National Park to continue the search for Arctic disjunct plants along the coast of Lake Superior. Mm -hmm.